Hello everyone, uh, welcome back. I just wanted to kind of run over a rules overview for Heroes in Normandy just to maybe help you get on your way to playing your first couple games. Uh, there is a lot. The game has many expansions, there's a lot of uh, symbology, Just there's, there's a lot to it. So I'm hoping I can give you just enough to get you started on your way. Now, when you have the rules, the first part of the rules talk about creating an army, which is going to be for versus play, like you, one, two other people, and you create armies and you battle each other. So generally not needed when you first start the game. So that's like two pages you can kind of skip in the rules. Uh, then it goes into the actions and, and how you play the game. And then finally there's the scenarios. Now, scenarios, we're not going to look at any one particular scenario, so we're not going to worry about setting up, say, Godsend, the first one. is a good one to start with. We're just going to kind of talk about the rules in general. That way you can jump into scenarios or do a low-level points battle just to practice the rules. So with the rules, the first thing I want to take a look at, though, are the counters, right? That's what drives the game, are the counters. And what's fantastic about the game is there's not charts and tables. Everything you need is located on the counter. So you've got your unit represented by, you know, like a top-down view. And you got some numbers. You need like a pen. Here we go. Let's look at some tweezers here. So when you're looking at your counter, a couple things here. Uh, not all counters have all these symbols, right? It's going to depend on the type of counter. Uh, so, for the example, this bazooka unit has counters that are unique to him or her. Uh, there's a destruction, like when attacking buildings. There's a range limit, extra point of damage against tanks, perforation, and flip means they have a backside. Ooh, they're hidden. It's like move around the battlefield hidden. Uh, and then there's how much damage it can take. So, this bottom row, all units have kind of the same. Uh, so let's start over here. So first, this is the movement. So you got this big arrow. That's how many movement points it gets to move around the battlefield. Then you have here the defense, or actually attack bonuses I'm looking at. So you got these color-coded shields that tell you the bonus it gets on its dice roll against that type of unit. And there's three types. You have infantry, which is yellow. Ve light vehicles, I'd say, is the, kind of this purplish color. And then this kind of grayish color are the heavy vehicles like tanks. Uh, so the bazooka doesn't get a bonus shooting infantry but does get a four and a four if it's shooting against vehicles. Then its own shield which points down is the defense shield he has a five so you have to roll at least a five on a six-sided die to hit the unit to do damage. There you go that's the basics you know in addition you know there's the name of the unit and possibly the unit that it's attached to. So I have here three German units as an example. So as you can see, you know, maybe if I zoomed in, but they all have the same sets of information along the bottom. So their movement, bonuses attacking different types of target types. Uh, and then on the right hand side is all the special symbols to that unit. We have an assortment. So a fire group, its special symbol is a dagger. That means it can do close assault. We have an MG42 team. Nothing really special here. It says it can flip over to its machine gun um, deployed side. So if I flip it, now it's deployed and it actually has suppressive fire that it can do. Um, and it's got, you know, you can flip it back over to the other side. And it only takes one hit. So no matter how you hit this team, it, it just takes one point of damage. And it's dead. Alright, so just to give you an idea. So all of these units have unique characteristics to them. And those are all listed in the book. That's the part that's sometimes tricky. Is trying to find where all those symbols are. Generally, if you're using the... Um, I think this was version 1.1 rules. That came with my box. Oh, this is 1.2b. So these 1.2b rules are also the PDF that's located on the Devil Pig Games website. So if your box game, uh, maybe you got one of the first editions, is not rules 1.2b, 
I'm trying to point that out there, 1.2B, to be or not to be, then you can get that off their website. I mean, it's all right. It does a pretty good job of explaining everything. But all your upgrade options, character traits, special abilities are all at the back of the book. And I'm going to say that's, that's where the learning curve for me was, is finding a particular symbol that I needed at a particular time. But let's say you've got that under hand now. You know you're looking for specific symbols. You know, keep it simple. If you start with a small scenario, just worry about the symbols on those particular units, right? Uh, you'll have plenty of time to learn all the symbols later as you play. Well, how do they play? Well, like any war game, it boils down to move, shoot, communicate. Okay, that's the big thing right there. We gotta move people, they gotta shoot, and you gotta give orders. Well, in this game, the way we do orders, that's the first part. You have orders, then you have the activation phase, and then a resupply phase. So, for example, your scenario is going to tell you what units you have. So it might say, use this recruitment tile, for example. Now, on the recruitment tile, when it gives you all of your assigned units, like, we'll look at a scenario, for example, like here. Let's say Godsend. We're not we're not playing that one, but let's say we were. It tells me I get this platoon, I get those attached guys, and the Germans get this platoon, and those attached guys of the platoon. And that gives me two order tokens, because there's two stars. Each star represents an order block that you're gonna get. Uh, you always get at least one bluff, which has no order. And since this is just a beginning scenario, there's no options that are given. I think, uh, I'm trying to look here. Yeah, I don't think they give you the option to buy anything extra. I'd have to reread all of the scenario points. But let's just say this is all you're given. This command unit gives you two stars. The German commander gives you two stars. That means you're going to have two orders. So let's say you're the German player. I grab my bluff. I grab my two orders, and now I'm ready to play. Let's say I've got, these are my German units. So during the order phase, you go back and forth with your opponent, and the idea is you try to trick them as to which units are going to actually activate. So I have three units, but only two orders. So one of these is going to be fake, the other two are going to be active. So I might say, trying to throw my opponent off, Pace, I might go well. Here's my number two order. Oh, I'm showing this and it's not even where you can see it. So I got my three orders. Yeah, and that's where the bluffing bidding mechanic kind of comes into play. Let's see if we can zoom in just a little bit on this part of the battlefield here. So with my three orders, I might say, well, I'm going to give this guy a two. So that's my first placement, but he's going to be order number two when we actually start the game. So I'm going to keep that up and hide it from my opponent. Then my opponent would place an order token. Then I'm going to say I'm going to place my my bluff because there's only me vehicles. For some reason I bought a bazooka team so I'm going to bluff. He's not going to do anything. Then my opponent places. Then I place. So now hidden to my opponent I have my first block, second block, third block placed. So when we actually start the game, you determine initiative, uh, you know, then you start activating units back and forth. So if I was a German player and I had initiative, and these were all up hidden, then I would activate order number one. It's that simple. He would do his action, then my opponent would do their order number one. So where it gets kind of confusing, confusion, I'd say confusing, there is one wooden token in here. You might have a couple. It's a special order token. Right here. This thing can be purchased usually uh, through order points like if you're setting up a scenario and you're buying stuff or sometimes you'll draw it with a card and the card will say use a special order. Special order essentially just lets you place it on a unit and you can activate that unit out of sequence at any point that you want can't use it to interrupt somebody like if they're currently moving you couldn't use that to activate something you, you just wait for your opponent to finish their activation and then instead of me moving my number two guy I could use this guy instead and then he'd be done and I'd still have my unit two for later 
The important thing, just remember, activate them in order. Then, if for some reason, if this unit hasn't gone and he got eliminated, and he was my number two block, well, there goes my number two with him, and I'd have no number two for that sequence. So, uh, you generally what I do to, you know, friendly game, I just let my opponent activate their number three person, or the next one in line, just to kind of keep the game moving. So that's, that's the easy part there. So you've assigned orders. Well, let's talk about moving. So easy. Everything you need is on your board. I zoomed in a bit. Hopefully you can see it. Maybe we can zoom in a little bit more. Move the board. Zoom in a little bit more. Boom! We're right in there. So now, I have here terrain. If there's no markings, right, that's open, clear terrain. So it would cost one. I can't pick these up with my tweezers. So I would just move one empty spot. That's one movement point, two movement points. You can move diagonally. That's a movement point. All right, so get your folks moving. One, two, three. But sometimes you got terrain. See, I set him up in a terrain, but let's say I was out here. Your terrain also has symbols on it. And that determines if you can move into it. It determines if you get defensive bonuses. So let's look at this confusing clump right here. So first it has a shield. It says infantry, when in there, get a plus two to their defense. So my machine gun team, when it's deployed, oh, they're not deployed. So my machine gun team, when it's deployed, holy cow, not only do they get a plus four defense on the counter, but they would also get plus two defense for the hedgerow. Oh, I, hold on. I just had a brain moment. Sorry, their defense is five, right? So they'd have defense of five plus two. That's a seven defense. Great. So you always want to be looking for the cover. Now there's some other, other things here. You have this triangle. This one has an X. That's blocking line of sight. If you've got a triangle that says like minus one or minus two, that's imposing a penalty on shooting through it. Okay, so this is basically saying no line of sight and no shooting through it. Uh, let me double check here. Whoops. See, I got the rules because I tend to forget things. So let me just make sure that's right. If it's the little minus symbol for vision. Hmm. So obstacles. So if you're in your book, page 11, this element totally blocks. So if it's the X or obscures, minus one or minus two line of sight that cross it. For each space crossed by the obscured line of sight, subtract the value in the symbol from the final dice result. These penalties are cumulative uh, if the obscured line of sight passes through multiple spaces of one or several elements. Target space does not count. So yes, so you're going to add up. Now this does not have a minus number in it. It just simply says no line of sight, no shooting through it. Okay, cool. We got that. Now. It does have some additional stuff. It has a purple move arrow and an X. That means movement, when you move on to it, you stop moving. Then it has a circle minus sign, which is impassable. So this is impassable train. And the shields attached to it by color tell you what this is impassable to. So in this example, and in almost all your train boards for Normandy, Tanks for the gray and light vehicles for purple are attached to the impassable, meaning vehicles can't move on there. So if you had a tank and you tried to drive into the, the hedgerow, your tank would be destroyed. It's that simple. So don't move on to these impassable terrains. Right here, you have impassable between. So it's got the two arrows and the impassable symbol. Uh, so you can't drive your tank through because it's considered one solid piece. Uh, there's situations where, like here, these guys are on a road. You know, you you can drive through, and with vehicles, it's kind of tough the way you move them. We'll talk about vehicle movement in a second. Your first couple snares should just be infantry. Um, oh man, move the map. So as I'm moving between impassable. 
you know, you can do that with a vehicle. You can move between impassables, but you cannot move them onto the actual impassable train. So that's simple. Just keep vehicles off the hedgerows. That's why there's like a hedgerow cutter you can buy. All right, so there's your defense. That's how you apply it. Let's talk about shooting. All right, easy. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. Just a scoonch. All right, so let's say I've got a support team here. Now, of course, it might be facing this way coming at you, the numbers towards your opponent. But let's say you're playing solo, so I can read all my numbers. It is important later because there are some units that have a designated firing arc. So what direction they're facing is, is important. But most units, and if there's no firing arc listed, they fire 360. So basic infantry, when you play solo, easy to keep track of. So I'm going to put him in a, a hedge. And he's going to have plus two to his defense. And we're going to have this MG42 team deployed. Because we'll say they started the game deployed. And they're going to shoot. So, who has initiative? Alright, so the German player rolled a 4, American rolled a 3. So the German player is going to fire first. So we count range. If you count a range of over 7, it's a minus 2 to your final die roll to see if you hit. So this is very short range. There's no bonuses for close range, you just happen to not get a penalty. So I'm 2 away and I look at my attack bonus so machine gun units against infantry get a plus four to hit plus four on that little shield symbol I've got a defense of four plus my two defense for being in the hedges total is six uh, so when I roll my attack die as a German I have to beat a defensive score of six and I've got a plus four already so essentially if I roll a one it's a miss. Anything else is going to be a hit. Alright, so I rolled 5. 5 plus 4 is 9. So I way overcame his defense in the hedges. Wow! Now he's got this flip symbol. If his flip symbol was red, the unit would be eliminated from the board. However, it says flip me. Now he's got reduced stats to a degree. Possibly reduced movement. But he does have a red skull so if he takes damage again he'll be eliminated so that was turn one that was my one order token then the Americans would get to activate whatever they had marked as number one which I didn't pull any American markers out but you would just go back and forth so my one person goes their number one person goes my number two goes their number two goes you go back and forth until all your actions are done uh, we won't read every single symbol on here, but machine guns, they do get suppressive fire. So there's a chance that what they could do is they double their attack bonus, and then they can like uh, spread their shots among other targets. So if I had several targets here, and if I had doubled my firepower bonus from plus four to eight, I could say I'm going to add two dice or two points to my die roll here, two to there, four to there. But when you hit, so if you made a successful hit, you wouldn't damage the opponent, which is kind of off the board a little bit, but instead you would put a suppressive token on them. Then when that person activates, they get minus two on their firing. All right, so that's an example of suppressive fire. Uh, one other icon, though, I will talk about is the assault icon. We use this a lot in our base games. You can only move on and do melee combat if you have an assault icon. Some units have like assault plus one. So they're really good at assault. This is just a basic assault. So I would move on here. And the way you do assault is it's two dice. So the attacker would roll two dice. And he gets to keep the highest die roll. So I rolled a two. Two plus my uh, plus two for fighting infantry stuff I'd have a four attack score then my defender if they don't have the assault symbol which this one doesn't he rolls one die if the person I'm assaulting also has an assault symbol for example then the defender also rolls two die keeps the best result so three plus his two so the defender in this case would have won the melee 
So that would push, push back the attacker and he would have to take a step loss or be destroyed if he was already wounded. So again, very, very simple mechanic. You just gotta keep in mind, it's the symbols and the abilities that start to add trickiness to it. You also have cards. Real quick on the cards. Uh, you got to have in your deck a minimum of 40, so you could trim down your deck to try and keep it with cards that you really want. Uh, some cards have a special symbol right here indicating you had to buy those with like a recruitment option. So you probably wouldn't see those in most scenarios unless the scenario says to use it. The card will have when you can play it, like this card could be played in the order phase, and then it's got the rules. And rules always supersede the rule book. So if your card says to do something that you normally can't, well, then you can do what the card says. The only thing that you cannot really do is combat during the resupply phase. That comes after all your activated units have done something. Okay, perfect. Thumbs up. Your units have activated their orders back and forth. Uh, then you have what's called the resupply phase. In that... Any of your units, including the one that had the uh, fake order, the bluff, let's move some stuff here. So you would take your bluff off, and then any, any of your units that did not activate, you could then get a free move action. And no combat takes place during the resupply. So you could start moving people up in anticipation of assaults and whatnot. So use that to your advantage. Uh, I think there's a zone of control, so you got to be careful. You can't like get too close to an opponent. But again, going off my memory is not always the best. So <laughs> I would have to check the book on that real quick. But that's the gist of the supply phase. You're going to move stuff that didn't actually activate. And then if you played any cards, you would draw back cards. Uh, discard bluff tokens, move one of your units, receive neither order. Okay, discard one suppressed marker per unit, resolve all effects, discard as many cards as you want, then draw a new one, check victory conditions. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty much it, yeah. Uh, I was just double checking the supply phase. They got a little section on supply phase. It doesn't say that I can't move near an enemy, so you could probably start using your supply phase if you want to start sneaking people up. But that's the basics. I mean, if you have specific questions, please ask. But as far as just movement, shooting, and uh, some of the communication elements on the board, I mean, that's, that's the basics. That, that should be enough to get you through scenario one. But if you have further questions beyond that or want to see specific things in action, please let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and uh, I hope it helps. All right, thanks a lot. Bye.